everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Becca Clark and I am the student recruiter for Thunderbirds online degree programs. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Ted Cross, Clinical Assistant Professor of Leadership and Director of Online Programs at Thunderbird. Thank you, Dr. Cross. Thank you, Becca. Today, I'm excited to be talking a little bit about leading innovation in uncertain times. And we'll leave some time at the end for some questions uh, from the audience. And Becca and Gina, if you can send me a message to make sure everybody is hearing me, that would be great. Okay, so the first thing I want to start off talking a little bit about is that change is really the new norm. And that is one of the problems with leading innovation today is that we are living in a very volatile environment and everything is constantly changing from stock markets to products to even people's lives. And, you know, I wanted to point out a few examples. One example from the S&P 500 is that the average tenure for companies on that index, you know, for about 50 years was 24 years. But by 2016, they think it's going to shrink to uh, 12 years and it's even gonna get even shorter. So top companies and top indexes are actually turning over quickly and quickly. And that is creating a very volatile environment and a place where people are changing jobs every 3.4 years on average. Another interesting thing that I noticed recently is that Walgreens, which has often been a staple business, and hold on, I have a couple questions on the chat here, just let me check. Oh, we're good, it's just Becca, okay. Uh, another interesting thing that I found uh, in some of the research is that Walgreens alone closed 600 stores in 2017, and that tends to be a company that we think is very uh, robust and doesn't have any problems with store closures, but they're even consolidating their business. And what John Cotter, the change um, management specialist, says is that the rate of change is not going to slow down anytime soon. If anything, competition in most industries will probably speed up even more in the next few decades. So the first thing I want to talk about in leading change in uncertain times and how to drive innovation is that we have to recognize that we are in very different, a very different era. We're in industry 4.0, where the digitization of services and products are happening across all types of sectors, and also digital communication is starting to uh, really take root um, as we are communicating now uh, digitally. Uh, it's interconnecting us all over the world, and it's also making some technologies and services obsolete. Now, the real core problem with all this change is that we as humans are resistant to change. And what do I mean by resistant to change? I mean that we often do not change unless we have to, unless we're forced to change or faced with some sort of crisis. It is, uh, we are very reluctant to change. And part of that is just uh, a mechanism of evolution. We are meant to keep the status quo and to stay safe and not to take risks. And so change is a threat and we often do not want to make any sort of changes uh, if we do not have to. But change is coming. Uh, let me give you an example I, I saw in the newspaper the other day. Uh, Florida real estate, especially on the coast, is higher than ever. The prices are going higher. There's lots of investors and speculators investing in condos and other uh, properties along the Florida coast. Yet, uh, some new studies from climate scientists show that um, Florida and its coastal regions is one of the most likely to be affected by extreme weather changes and or rising sea levels. And so there may be a problem in the next 20 to 50 years of sea levels kind of eating up parts of those coastlines. Now, I'm not saying this will happen for certain, but it certainly uh, points to the fact that humans we hear one thing, uh, facts from scientists or predictions that may come to be, and our behaviors don't match. Um, 
we are still buying more and more real estate along, you know, more and more beachfront property. Another interesting, uh, another interesting tidbit about Florida real estate is that closed sales for single family homes in Florida increased by 4% in 2018 and prices are predicted to grow 5% in 2019. And if you look at real estate prices in Florida, they have a pretty steep curve over the last five to 10 years. And it's starting to maybe look like we're outpacing uh, value and overpricing things. But again, we, we as humans forget things that have happened in the past, uh, such as the 0809 crash. And so we continue to do the same behaviors because we won't change unless we are faced with some sort of imminent danger in many ways. So why do people resist change? Well, um, Peter Senge, the famous strategy and leadership um, author, wrote that people don't resist change, they resist being changed. And I think that's true. Uh, we're okay with change as long as it doesn't include us. And that's a, that's a problem. But we also need to recognize that people, as uh, John, John Gilbraith here says, if people are faced with a choice between changing one's mind and proving that there is no need to do so, almost everyone gets busy on the proof. And that's because if we admit that we need to change, that also has the assumption that our old ways of doing things are not correct anymore, or that we have made choices that may not be um, so useful in the current or future situations, and that requires a lot of humility. So we just don't like to change in general, but a lot of times that's because um, we don't recognize the environment around us. We don't recognize market conditions, or we think that, um, yes, change needs to happen, but I am not the one who needs to change as somebody else. Now, of course, John Cotter is famous for his eight steps to help people move through change. And what I'm arguing here is that if you want to drive innovation, the first thing you need to do as a leader is recognize that we're living in a volatile market environment in a volatile uh, some, sometimes uh, climate. And oftentimes there's lots of different technological changes that are affecting our workplace, our home place. And that as such, we need to move people through change because change is the new norm. Now what Cotter argues here is that you need to move through these eight steps and help people move through them and those, of course, are established urgency. And this goes to this idea that we as humans will not change unless we see urgency. And so we need to create urgency for people often. Create a guiding coalition, that is, get people on the same page in alignment with the change initiative and get that sort of um, social proof so everyone else will join along in the change initiative communicate a clear vision to where are we actually headed as the leader we have to point people into a very clear vision and then remove those obstacles to the vision many of you have been involved in uh, change initiatives within organizations and there's lots of obstacles in the way that your bosses did not remove and so the change was never realized because you can never get to the end goal you need to empower people to act and plan for and create short wins or short-term wins or what I call quick wins. And that is what are some simple things that you can get done really quickly, some low hanging fruit that will build momentum, organizational momentum towards that vision. Then you consolidate those wins together and start to institutionalize the change through processes and uh, organizational culture. Now these are great steps and they all make a lot of sense, but they're pretty complicated especially if you're working in a volatile environment that is changing day to day to implement all these things. So I actually like to think about it from a different model and it's from Gregerson and Black. It's from their book. It starts with one. It is in many ways a summary and consolidation of John Cotter's steps, but it's into three different big buckets. And these big, big buckets represent the barriers of why people don't change and how we might address those. And the first barrier of why people don't change is because they fail to see the need for change. So remember our Florida coastline example, the, the impending danger of rising sea levels is too far away for people to worry about it. And so they don't see that there's a need to change buying behaviors, for example. 
Then there's the failure to move. You might recognize that there's a reason to um, actually make a change, but the question is, um, can you actually start executing and moving through the change? And many people see, see and recognize the need, but don't actually mobilize. And last is failing to finish. So even after you, after you start working on that change initiative, we need to make sure that we are finishing. I think this is a, a very good model and framework and mindset um, for leaders to have who are trying to drive innovation, especially in uncertain times. Take this three-part uh, model and implement it into your organization or an initiative that you're trying to lead. And oftentimes, the very hardest part is the failure to see the need to change, and that can be where it's most useful to begin. Now, let me explain a little bit more about um, the fundamentals of change according to Gregerson and Black and how you might use them. Now, the first reason why people don't see a need to change is because the old ways of doing things worked well in the past. Um, you might have experienced this in your own life. You have a certain, uh, for example, way that you work uh, on a computer system and it worked really well in the past. Things changed at work and now you have to adopt a new computer system and you want to do it the old way, but you can't, and so you're no longer very good at it. And so what people often want to do is just revert back to the old processes or the old ways of doing because they don't want to show that they are novices again in the new paradigm. And so we have to, for ourselves and for others, understand that it's okay to be a novice for a time as we are moving into a new paradigm, a new way of doing things. So that's the first reason why people just, they don't want to change because they'd have to admit that the old ways don't work anymore. And sometimes it's hard to let go of those old ways. Um, and, and number two, you hear, you see here in the second sentence, over time they have become the wrong ways to do things. So one phrase they use in Gregerson and Black's book is that uh, the old right ways are now the new wrong ways. And really what is happening is that people try to apply old models of thinking into new paradigms and then it doesn't work out very well at all. Another thing to think about is to start using new behaviors and methods. Uh, you, at first, you will need to rec recognize that you will be not very good, a novice, and that's okay. And you'll want to return to the old ways, as I mentioned, but you'll want to make sure that we reinforce our employees that it's okay that the new, the new methods or the new mental shifts that we're making in our organizations, that we're not going to be very good at the first. And as we continue, we'll get better. And then when we stick with new approaches, sooner or later, we'll start to get good again. So this is just the nature of change. It's like relearning a new process or any sort of new mental paradigm. We're going to want to go back to those old behaviors, but those old behaviors will only get us old results. We need to be operating in the new paradigm. And so as leaders, we need to make sure that we are reinforcing and tolerant of some, um, some opportunities for failure. So if change is the new normal, we need to help people move through these, change, uh, these changes, not only internally, but externally. And I think that it's important to employ some of these models like Gregerson and Black to show people how to work through a change initiative step by step and how to create urgency around the need for change. One of the examples that we often give uh, is about um, Motorola and when Motorola was really, really uh, the top dog in town on making cell phones and they're making all kinds of cell phones and everyone had uh, the, the Motorola flip phone and then a new technology emerged called digital technology versus the analog cellular service that we all used to have. And Motorola said, oh, well, we don't really need to worry about that digital. We don't think it's going to catch on. We're just going to stick with analog. And they ignored this little company called Nokia, which uh, pretty soon ate all of its market share because it had uh, digital cell phones. And one of the problems, of course, was that um, Motorola didn't see the need to change. Um, and they weren't realizing that the market that they are operating in, in the digital wireless uh, mobile service uh, area and handheld um, phone 
device market was rapidly moving, that it wasn't just going to be an incremental change, but that new technologies would disrupt things and move things in a different direction. So not only do you need to help people move through change, but also we want to help people drive innovation and be creative. I love this quote here. Scholars have shown that in the 21st century organizational environment, creativity and innovation are the primary sources of competitive advantage. Think about that for a minute. In the 21st century, one of the biggest competitive advantages any of us can have in our organization or even ourselves is the ability to be creative and innovative so that we can create new, new ideas and new products that will move forward. Now, the problem is that in a volatile environment, in an uncertain environment, people are less likely to take risks. Why are they less likely to take risks? Because they're worried about external factors or internal factors that are being uh, influenced by external factors. And so we will tend to be more conservative. This is called the status quo bias, right? It's a mental heuristic that is built into us, into our brains, that we are more likely to leave things as is and not upset the apple cart rather than try something new and take risks. People become increasingly risk averse. Another interesting thing, even though millennials tend to want to work in environments that are very purpose-driven, uh, millennials and studies on millennials have shown they're increasingly risk averse and debt averse on their spending habits. And so we need to create environments within which people can be creative and innovative. Some ideas. As a leader, ways to help drive innovation comes down to two main things. One is leadership and its style. So are we giving a clear direction, a vision, and creating quick wins and momentum for success? And then second, and this is the one that we're going to be talking about now, what is the organizational climate? Uh, is, is, is there culture and strategies that encourage and sustain innovation rather than just lip service to uh, saying we wanna be innovative and creative. Let me give you an example from Dan Pink from his book, Drive. He cites a famous experiment where uh, two groups of participants were given a cardboard box containing thumbtacks, a candle and matches, and asked to attach the candlestick to the wall. Now, here you can see the solution to the problem which is that you take the thumbtacks out of the box, uh, use the thumbtacks to put the box to the wall, put the candle in the box, and then light the, light the candle and you have solved the problem. Now, most people didn't do this. Uh, a lot of people didn't see the box as part of the solution. And so they were you know, lighting matches and trying to melt the candle on the side and stick it to the wall and all kinds of different things. But what, what this experiment addresses is something called functional fixedness, which is the mindset that we don't see that sometimes the container in this instance or the cardboard box that contained the materials to solve the problem is an integral part of solving the problem to begin with. And what they did is giving this experiment to two different groups. One group was timed and told that uh, see how fast they could they could finish and solve this problem. And the other group was said, we're gonna time you and we're gonna see how fast you can finish this problem, but the faster you solve it, the more money we're gonna give you. And what they found is that the group that had incentives with mo money attached, that group that said, hey, if you solve it faster, we'll give you some money or more money, um, they actually solved the problem slower than the group that was just told, hey, we're gonna see how fast you can solve this problem. And so sometimes um, in traditional management practices, we wanna use carrots and sticks to motivate our employees to be innovative. And sometimes that can work and sometimes that can backfire. If we're asking people to be creative and innovative, uh, it is often counterproductive to focus people 
on some sort of carrot strategy. In other words, people in this instance who had more freedom and less pressure of trying to solve things uh, to gain more money um, were more successful. And so are we creating an environment where we are um, making people very narrow-minded? Now, this isn't to say that bonus structures don't work in certain instances, they do, um, but they will focus people's minds down onto a specific task. So if you're selling X number of widgets per month, perhaps a bonus structure works really well. But if you're asking someone to invent a new product, perhaps a bonus structure just for inventing that specific product could be counterproductive. So we need to think about that as leaders, especially as people are thinking of being in an uncertain environment. Now, here's some other examples from Ken, Ken Robinson about how we can engender creativity and be a creative leader. Now, what I like is that Ken Robinson says that creativity is the process of having original ideas that have value. So it's not just coming up with interesting things for interesting things. It's not just having a bunch of bean bags and foosball tables and uh, ping pong tables and free cereal at your workplace. It's about getting collaboration together to create ideas that have value, not just creating ideas for ideas sake. Now, just because uh, it's a novel idea doesn't always mean it's a good one, right? And that's sort of what Robinson's getting at. So the first time someone put peanut butter and jelly together in a sandwich, uh, that was a novel creative idea. And it was useful because people liked it. Now, if you put peanut butter and something else together, uh, maybe it wouldn't have worked so well. And so that would have been unuseful. Now, I'm not saying that you need to get to the great uh, and creative solution right away. There's many discards along the way, but I think we have to be careful that we're not just encouraging creativity for creativity's sake, but rather creativity towards that singular vision and goal that we set as leaders. Now, second, creative leadership creates a culture where everyone can have ideas and feel that they're valued. So this in uh, many organizations is termed a yes and mentality. What do I mean by yes and mentality? Well, you might have been in a brainstorming or a design session or a design thinking session where people were putting out lots of different creative solutions for a problem or a product or a service. And uh, the boss sounded something like this. Yes, that's a great idea, but, and then they would list all the problems with the problem. And that mentality needs to change to yes and. So yes, that's a great idea. And have you thought about X, Y, and Z rather than using but, which shuts down everyone, or however, which shuts down everyone's ideation. And so can we use yes and to continue to riff off of that original idea until we arrive collaboratively at an idea that is very useful? So keep the yes and mindset and mentality in mind as you are trying to be a creative leader. And then last, be creative to a purpose. Now, this isn't the same as trying to have creativity that has value, as we mentioned before, but this goes to the idea of being creative towards that overall purpose or objective that you have set as a leader for the organization, the division, or the team. Now, how can we encourage innovation? Well, again, we mentioned having the yes and mentality, but also a shared and collaborative leadership style can be helpful. And that's because people will feel like they are having more input and they will actually have more input into decisions made in the organization and solutions that they come up with. And we need a foster environment that is conducive for creativity to flourish. And one thing I've mentioned here is creating space where it's safe to fail. It might not be safe to fail in every instance, so we need to delineate to our uh, followers or to our counterparts and colleagues within organizations that there are certain spaces where it's safe just to throw out ideas, to try things, and to fail at things. 
Of course, one of the famous uh, examples of this is Google's hack days where everyone works on a project that they think would be interesting for uh, an entire day and they you have come up with some interesting ideas um, out of that, such as Gmail and some other things that came out of those hack days, but it's a, a set aside particular time when people can work on things that normally they wouldn't work on, uh, that isn't quote unquote part of their job, where they can be creative, they can fail, and that the only, um, the only sort of carrot and stick is that if you come up with something great, then it might be turned into a real product there's real no down there's really no downside to failing also we as leaders must value creativity ourselves so are we as a leadership team for example in our organizations practicing the yes and mentality are we tolerant of uh, sort of some failure uh, in the system as we are coming up with new ideas are we creative enough to try new things or are we still in that old mindset that the old ways of doing are correct and there's no reason for us to continue to move. And then we have to treat the organization as a living system. So if we change one thing in one part of the organization, it necessarily will affect another part of the organization. And so we need to make sure that there are special uh, circumstances or spaces where we can make sure that it's safe for people to fail, for people to try new things, but we also need to be cognizant that if, if we don't set aside those kinds of safe spaces and we have people trying things in sort of our core business, that that'll, that'll create a ripple effect. So on the negative side, we gotta make sure that um, we sort of are delineating where it's safe to try new things. And then on the positive side, if we are making a collaborative and open environment to creativity, it'll have a spillover effect throughout the system of the organization. Now, challenge and, and free up employees' time to produce fresh solutions. So is there set aside time for actually working on new things? Oftentimes our days become back-to-back -back meetings working on reactive problems rather than being proactive and actually blocking out time to work on real projects or come up with new solutions or have actual um, team meetings or design sessions to work uh, together on new solutions. It's also helpful to make sure that there's a diversity in the team that you put together uh, in thought and person um, in background. It's often important to um, make, make the team centered on a specific problem or challenge and then draw people from all different types of departments to try to solve that. One of the best examples I heard here at ASU a while back was there was the NSF, a, NS, a, a, a National Science Foundation grant uh, to work on trying to find new treatments for cancer and I knew that uh, there was a physicist who was on the team for this uh, finding new solutions to cancer. And I asked him, why would a physicist be on, you know, this sort of medical uh, problem? And he said, well, we need people from all different backgrounds who have different ways of thinking of things to approach a problem from different standpoints. And so this is a great approach to use in your organizations also. Another thing that we have to be really aware of is that mindset is very important in driving innovation in organizations, the way we think about things as leaders and then communicate those to our team. One lesson is that we need to ante anticipate that things are going to be disrupted. We talked a little bit about um, Motorola and its lack of wanting to change and what happened there. But another example, of course, is Netflix and Blockbuster. Uh, sometimes we forget what our core business is and because we forget what our core business is, we forget to see the, the very big disruptors that are coming. So Blockbuster thought it was in the VHS re resale and rental of movies business, but really they were just in the dis distribution of movies business. Netflix caught on to this and of course they went to DVDs that they mailed to you. 
but Netflix could have really tanked if they hadn't realized that the next, the next iteration of their business would be in the streaming department. And even after that, the next would be in creating their own content. So what Netflix realized is that they're really in the entertainment business and they do the, the kinds of products they have are TV shows and movies and now some interactive uh, films. And so they have been able to roll with the punches as technology change and as consumers desires for the way that that content is delivered has changed. Blockbuster, not so much. Now, of course, there's the famous example of uh, Ford and, you know, Mr. Ford would always ask people what they wanted and they would say a faster buggy, right? So the buggy business was disrupted, of course, by the Model T, but why? Because Ford realized that he was in the transportation business, not in sort of the faster horse business or the faster buggy business, right? So we need to, as leaders, take the broad view and ask ourselves, what core business are we really in? And how can we um, be aware of changes that are coming and adopt in those changes along the way? Second, we need to link incremental and breakthrough innovation efforts by focusing on single shared aspirations. So we talked about having quick wins and moving those into larger consolidated wins through a change process, but that all depends on having a shared and aspirational vision. And being able to, to recognize again, what kind of business you're in. I mean, Xerox is a, is a great example. You know, they, they thought they were just making printers. They were actually the first people to invent out of their sort of skunk works unit, the graphical user interface, which we all use with the mouse point and click now. And they developed it, but they didn't ever do anything with it and eventually failed to commercialize the graphical user interface. And so someone else ended up adopting it. Of course, that was Apple. Now, why did that happen? One, because they didn't see that there was a need, that there could be a huge potential market for this. And second, there was a disaggregation between research and development, R&D, and the core business. And there wasn't a, a way to integrate those together in a way that would create small wins that would lead to new products. Lesson three, recognition that disruptive innovation can inform strategy, just as strategy can and should inform disruptive innovation. Now, disruptive innovation is interesting uh, because it's when an industry is totally turned on its head. We often talk about Uber and taxis and the way that things have been changed there. Uh, an example from the past that is now in, in the present is Corning, they started off as a glass manufacturer uh, and they had been making all kinds of specific components for years and years. But one thing that they had to change over time is they were making a lot of products. They were making a lot of, uh, if you remember Corning ware, these dishes and these glassware, they were making all these things. Eventually what they found out is that their real core competency was in just making components for other companies including this new uh, super strong glass that is being used in Apple products. And so they had to decide that, okay, we are no longer going to make consumer products and they sold off those divisions. We're going to make components for other companies. And as they changed, they re they reconfigured their strategy in a new environment. A couple tools I want to point out for, helping lead these innovation changes. Uh, User-centered design, or sometimes called human-centric design. This is something borrowed from anthropologists. It's really about creating a minimum viable product or a paper MVP, putting it in front of people, and then getting feedback. So rather than just inventing a new process or product in a vacuum, um, we need to actually put low quality and low cost prototypes in front of potential users and have them give us feedback. What this does is allows us to uh, actually talk to the customer along the design build process and make changes as we go. One of the most interesting things I ever saw was uh, we were working on 
a really complicated website. Um, and we had some consultants come in and they had just drawn a wireframe on a piece of paper like you see on your screen. And a wireframe is just an outline of what a web page might look like. And they put it in front of a focus group and they said, okay, imagine this is a web page. Imagine this is, if you click here, this happens. If you do this, this happens. And they got lots of feedback before they even built a single piece or did, even did a single piece of code. They're able to get feedback on how users would rather see that web page um, delivered, designed, and created. Also allows us to optimize the product service around how users can and want or need to use the product or service. So we need the whole idea of user-centric design is going out, asking people to try a, a, a really cheap, easy to make prototype, even if it's only an idea of a prototype on paper, and then getting that feedback and incorporating as we go and making the changes rather than building a whole product and then hoping that you know, our audience loves it. Now, one downside to using design thinking and user-centered design is that it often only creates evolutionary change or incremental change. So we might come with a new product and put it in front of people, and then they will tell us what tweaks they want on it, and then we'll create it, and that's, that's fine. But it's really only helping us incrementally change that product uh, into what users would like the best. It often doesn't help us come up with a new moonshot product that no one had ever thought of. So if Steve Jobs had went and asked focus groups what they wanted uh, as far as cell phone technologies, they probably would have said a better BlackBerry, some, some version of that. But he didn't ask focus groups. He actually created the iPhone, then put that in front of user groups to improve it. So if you want to come up with a, a really earth shattering idea, it's often interesting to look at what's coming as a leader and try to invent an innovative product and then put it in front of uh, in front of a user group or a potential user group to help you refine it both of both of those kinds of uh, techniques are useful sometimes you need to come up with something completely new and sometimes you just need to come up with a new version of a website that works better um, so either one is valuable but you have to know that there's downsides to both ways of driving innovation. Another, another trademark of uh, innovative organizations is that they're agile, they're able to change as needed. And some of the ways that they're structured is that they have a very clear strategy, which we've talked about, that strategy aligns with the vision. They have a structure, we've talked about some of that. There's room for people to actually uh, make mistakes. There are some processes that, uh, or innovation processes. This might be a design thinking um, process. It might be an agile or a lean process that you might use. And then you have to have the right people in technology to actually implement those ideas. Now on strategy, really, I wanna point out a couple things as we're, I'm starting to run out of time a little bit here. Um, shared purpose and vision as well as flexible resource allocation are very important. So we might say that we want to have innovation in a particular division of a company or a particular area, but are we willing to reallocate resources as necessary to actually create the space within which people can be creative? Just, just because we want innovation to happen, we also have to make sure that we are resourcing it. Structure. Often clear, flat structures uh, are, are more innovative and that's because there's less hierarchy to work through and so people are more willing to put forth their new ideas and those ideas get to sort of the higher level of management in a quicker fashion because there's less levels to move through. And then process, um, is there information transparency? That's what I want to, to emphasize here. Is the information shared in a, across teams so that everyone can make a decision quickly and then continue to iterate on the idea or change course? How many times have you seen a, a solution to a problem created in a silo and one of two things happen. One is it's finally distributed out to the larger group 
and there's a lot of problems there and so that solution is thrown out or the solution already exists in a different form and we have spent a lot of time um, working on a new solution when if we just would have communicated that solution already was in place. People, um, role mobility I think is very important on the people uh, aspect. Can people move from one role to the next depending on the project they're working on? Not, not that an accountant person would become a designer, but rather can the person who is working on the finances also help take on a design role with the design team to inform it from their expertise standpoint? So we need to make sure that there's some role mobility that people, they might not change job titles, but they might take on a certain kind of role on a team that is working on a particular project and bringing their expertise to bear on that project. Technology, I think the more, more modular we can be in our organizations and the less beholden to large, uh, cumbersome platforms, the more likely we are to make changes because it's easier. Now, the last thing I want to leave with you here on this entire idea of leading innovation in uncertain times is that because we are in a volatile environment, both, both economically and also um, just stress levels, I was reading some studies lately that showed that stress levels across the world in employees are, are increasing. And so we need to be cognizant that employees are less likely to take risks. And so we need a model as a leader that it's okay to take risks within specific uh, safe spaces or set aside projects so that we can help people to see that it's okay to take risks and to try to be creative to find new solutions to either old problems or new problems while simultaneously we as leaders modeling that we have to change as well. If we're not modeling that there is change needed, uh, no one else is going to follow. And I would be glad to take a few questions if Becca would like to um, have those uh, over to me. Thank you, Dr. Cross. Thank you for sharing that. And I'll take this opportunity to also invite everyone to our next webinar on March 21st at the same time. I've put the uh, details registration link on the chat box. If you have any questions for Dr. Cross at this time, would you please post those in the Q&A? session at the bottom of your screen. We do have time for a few questions. Michael says thanks very much. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Yes, thank you, Michael. No other questions out there? Here we go from Anonymous. Do you think creativity workshops can help boost readiness for change in an organization? So I think that uh, creativity workshops can be helpful to get people to understand what creativity means rather than just uh, a buzzword. It can actually put forth a real process that people can work through. I think the design thinking workshops and understanding how the design thinking process works uh, can be very useful to have a shared understanding across your team of a process that you can implement that is organized, is, is an organized way of catalyzing creativity. So I would start with um, either formalized creativity process training or design thinking training. From Russ. Great presentation, thanks. Thank you, Russ. From Cecilia, you referenced Ken Robinson. Can you share what material you obtained it from? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so Ken Robinson wrote a book called Spark, uh, and he, you can find him also, he has a famous TED Talk on uh, education, and you can see uh, his TED Talk on education and on uh, creativity. From Pedro, very informative. He takes good insights from this. 
He has a question regarding how do you define value on the innovation to support prioritization of ideas? So I think the one thing that is very tough when you're trying to come up with creative and innovative solutions and move the ball forward is that it's going to be hard to quantify results before you've created something. So what has to happen is that the organization has to be okay with investing some resources into uh, a group of people or projects that will bear some hits and some misses. And then to be able to show over a period of time, which would have to be, of course, longer than just six months with investment behind that, that there would be uh, a way to move through a process and then come up with some of those hits. So it's only in hindsight, unfortunately, in many ways, uh, that we can show real quantified value on these creative and innovation efforts. So if I'm moving through a design thinking process, it's only at the end of that that I might be able to show the new value I've created. And I might go through several projects of design thinking and only a couple are any are really any use at the current time. Or uh, it might be a while until one of the new solutions actually hits. So we have to have an agreement either at the management level or the leadership level of an organization that you're gonna make a commitment to being innovative in creating those structures with the associated investment. From Bo, what would you say is the best way to deal with objections to innovation that cite risk dangers? So I think the best way to mitigate uh, when you get pushback, especially from those that have the mentality that the old ways of doing are doing just fine and why should we change anything, is to suggest a small pilot. So the, if you say, uh, why don't we just pilot this? I, I hear your concerns. I understand that what is currently working is okay. But why don't we just pilot this idea on a small scale over a short period of time and see what the results are? And you can say, and if it doesn't work, it's okay. We'll go back to doing it the old way. And it's just a pilot. We're only going to do it with a few people over here. We're only going to spend a little bit of money and just try it out. And that gives you space to try it without threatening the status quo. And it allows you to create uh, results that you can bring back to show how much better that is if it is the case. And if it isn't the case, then it's something that can easily be discarded. How long can it take to move an organization from a non-creative environment where people are being micromanaged to a creative environment under new leadership? Well, it, it's, I, I don't have the answer to that. It can take various, you know, periods of time for that to change, and sometimes it doesn't change at all. But what I can say is that if you have uh, small pockets of either people or divisions or projects that people are working on in a creative way, and then showing those results and advertising them across the organization as the leaders and or if the leaders are rewarding those efforts, then you will start to have more diffusion of creativity across the organization. From Heather, what is your suggested approach to dealing with organizations where there seems to be too much hierarchy to get through in order to implement innovative ideas? Yeah, so I think, you know, when you're in hierarchical and bureaucratic um, organizations, Many people say, well, that's completely antithetical to innovation, and they wouldn't be wrong, but it doesn't mean you can't have innovation in those instances. One great approach is to create an R&D division or a skunk works division or a group of people uh, that works together on innovative projects inside of the, the larger bureaucracy. And then what can happen is that leadership and others can throw novel ideas into that innovation group they can work out pro, uh, problems and solutions and projects on a, on a sort of small scale basis. And um, it doesn't threaten the overall hierarchy of the entire organization. So creating, I think, an R&D or an innovation group within these larger organizations can be a great place to start because once that innovation group has some high profile wins, then people are more likely to adopt them. 
Afshin, I will send the PowerPoint and video recording tomorrow. Here's a question from Little Joe. How do you describe creativity in your organization? Where should leadership help define an up-to-date definition on creativity? So really, I think that what's useful is to go look at Ken Robinson's work. And I really like his definition that creativity isn't just having lots of interesting ideas. It's, create, it's useful ideas, things that you can use. So I think you're right. You do need to have an organizational definition of what creativity means because that's so nebulous and define it within your organizational context and then yes you can you can update it um, as you are as you are moving along but have a core definition that you can refer to over and over from owen which leadership style is the best in leading organization in uncertain and a complex world well I think that there's lots of types of leadership that can work in sort of uncertain times. I do think that uh, charismatic or transformational leadership can be very important because it centers people on an overall vision and mobilizes them to work very hard because they're inspired. And that can be useful if lots of other things are changing. If we can have a North Star goal and vision that we can sort of motivate people to, towards in an emotive way. They'll work very hard towards that goal, even if there might be chaos in the processes or the external environment. That said, it's also very useful to have some people who are transactional in their leadership style because um, below the vision setting, there has to be someone who is helping make sure that tasks are getting done in a quick manner because uh, things are changing so rapidly. From Tay, thanks for the presentation. What advice can you give on bringing innovation mindset to a team that have been mostly working in silos? Yep. So I think that the first thing to do is to start center, centering projects uh, as problem-centric rather than discipline or silo-specific. One example here at the university is we have um, the Global Institute for Sustainability. Now, that's a problem-centric institute. It's about sustainability globally. And we draw professors from business schools, from management schools, from the sustainability school, from engineering, from mathematics, from physics, all to come to bear on singular problems that would be encapsulated in the main theme of global sustainability. So the first thing I would say is we need you, it would be useful if you identified what problems you're trying to solve, put those in the center of groups and said, look, we're going to put a diverse team that is uh, interdisciplinary in nature to all work on this problem together and start piloting it that way. From Ankit. Since we can't learn everything, and if we don't know things, then it's hard to lead, how can learning and leadership be associated? Yeah, I think that leaders have to be lifetime learners. Uh, the only way that you're going to overcome that first barrier of, of, uh, of change management that we saw earlier, the failure to see the need to change, is by constantly educating yourself. That doesn't mean you need to read everything that's out there, but you need to find the key people that you want to listen to and the key sort of uh, resources you want to follow and then to regularly make time to learn. Um, that can be very tough when we're very busy, but you know, a lot of you are on this webinar today because you've made time to learn. That's a great leadership trait. Uh, as you learn new things, you can implement them into your organization. From Michael. The millennials' avoidance of risk and debt is very interesting. What do you make of this? Well, what I make of it is that it's a reaction to Gen X and baby, boom, baby boomer uh, sort of buying behaviors in the past, but also that uh, millennials tend to be very purpose-driven. And so, again, if, if you want to pick a leadership style to lead in uncertain times, and in particular, lead millennials, I would say you have to be charismatic or transformational because they want to know, is my work contributing to something bigger than myself? And if so, 
uh, how is it making the world better and how does my contribution line up with that larger goal? From Jesse, great talk on Dan Pink's work on drive regarding carrot and stick approach versus inspirational leadership. Which do you think is the most utilized based on your experience? Well, it's easier to use carrot and stick management and leadership techniques. And so that tends to be the way that we think of things. And that's a product of the third industrial revolution and the second industrial revolution. But we're now in the fourth industrial revolution where most every job requires creative and innovative thinking and complex problem solving. So we have to be careful of how we're in, how, what we're measuring, what KPIs we're measuring, and what incentives we're creating in organizations. From Joel, how can one, how can innovation be implemented if the lower to mid-level employees are the ones who have brilliant and innovative ideas, but it is leadership that seems to be too traditional and set in their old ways? So that's a really hard one. Um, sometimes you're not going to be able to implement the type of innovation you would like to if you can't get any buy-in from the upper level of leadership. Again, it's not that that innovation is always top down, but there is the reality of decision-making power. So one suggestion to go back to the idea of piloting something small on the side and then showing results, it's, it's very rare that you won't find a leader in the leadership team that, would be, that wouldn't be interested in a pilot you ran that, that resulted in, in great you know, revenue, for example. So if you can run a, a pilot that is successful and innovative on a small scale, then bring those results to various leaders and you'll have to shop it around to see who it resonates with. You might be able to get traction that way. From Anonymous, really like the answer about using a pilot that's been an effective tool in our organization. My question is, how would you recommend getting leaders above us to truly buy into innovative approaches rather than just giving lip service to it? Yeah, I think that um, one thing that can be useful, someone else asked about how do you start moving the culture of uh, from a rigid culture to a creative culture. It is, it is helpful if you can get leadership to go through a little bit of training on creativity or design thinking so they can catch the vision of it. Uh, of course, IDEO is famous for inventing design thinking, and now it's at the Stanford D School. If you can also give um, examples of leaders who are well-respected in the same field as your leaders who are not adopting innovation um, and show that they have adopted processes that are innovative, like design thinking, that can help actually spur them along. What I'm saying is that it's often more useful um, to have them be trained in and or adopt a specific process that leads to innovation rather than just trying to get them to accept the idea of innovation at large. And that one way to do that is to point to peers, uh, peers in their industry who are doing similar things get your leader's creative juices going and get them to get some training or at least adoption of philosophy on process. Thank you, Dr. Cross. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you in a few weeks for our next month's webinar. Thank you all, have a great day.